Hey folks, George Leoniak here with New Geometry and I am uh, super excited to be bringing this video to you. Uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, information in this one. Uh, I'm just kind of overwhelmed with the amount of uh, information that I have kind of uh, come through here to kind of bring together a lot of facets of sacred geometry. We're going to be looking at, uh, you know, the earth, the DNA, the galaxies. Um, we're going to be looking at a lot of big picture, but we're going to also bring it down to kind of the simple uh, sacred geometry and really show how it's all connected and related and that sacred geometry is pointing to this, um, you know, right in our face and all the beautiful designs that we see. Um, so, uh, like I normally do, I'm going to share the screen and uh, bounce back and forth with some of the uh, uh, props that I have over here. Um, before I do that, I want to show you one thing because my, my last video, the Phi Yantra, really opened up a whole new uh, area of exploration. Whenever there's kind of a new system, that kind of uh, you know, geometric system that I'm working with, it opens up a whole new facet of interest and research. So I, I decided to build that 3D because I knew it contained the platonic solid. So I just want to show you as best I can on the screen here. I've got to back up some um, because I built this structure out of zone tools and I think it's just a fascinating, fabulous design to see the Phi Yantra um, in its uh, entirety in this structural design that this lattice of string, the Phi Yantra uh, shape head on looked like this in many of the drawings. I know it's the background makes it a little difficult to see, but essentially that's an icosahedron and a dodecahedron in a cube in the, in the center there. And this larger lattice was what the uh, string is tied off the edges of this cube. And it's just a um, amazing to have built the Phi Yantra based on that template that I shared in the previous video. So I've been contemplating and drawing this quite a bit. And uh, it, like I said, it's opened up and pulled together so many areas uh, in sacred geometry, for me at least, that I'm gonna share with you here. Um, and to really, I could do a video on each one of these little segments, so you'll probably see more of this in the future. Um, so it's gonna be kind of an overview of you know, directions that I'll be heading. Uh, so let's see here. Let me let me jump into the sharing screen here, and um, yeah. So I here's the uh, the images of that again that you could see a little more clearly now. Um, you know, as you could see, it's a big structure. This was the Phi Yantra design that. Um, you know, contained the nested phi ratios and all the square roots and everything like that, uh, square root of phi proportions. And, and uh, so here's the dodecahedron here, right here in the center of the, uh, the lattice that you see there. <clears throat> so there's the dodecahedron right in the center. You've also got the icosahedron, which is now built off of a stellated dodecahedron. And the whole thing is just you know, within the beautiful wire, you could see that these two lines here that are going up to the corners, this kind of, you know, four pointed star uh, that's into the corners is within this. These orange tips are the pyramids, which I didn't put in there. Uh, here, you know, you could see it from a different view. So this is the pentagonal view. And we're going to, you know, look at a lot of these um, other views because as I was rotating it around, you know, as I'm always saying in a lot of my videos that, you know, we can't become too attached to one particular uh, view that we, we look at and say, well, this is, you know, contains uh, everything. Every view has something different uh, to offer uh, from, a, from a slightly different uh, perspective. Let me just get the, uh, the scaling here correct for how I want the, uh, the video to show up. Uh, that's a little bigger. So, um, you know, I was working on, uh, first of all, my part of my exploration started off with this. So I'm going to kind of take you on a little bit of a journey. Hopefully it makes sense because this is summarizing, you know, 
quite a few years of thinking about a lot of these concepts, uh, a lot of these things, and working with the sacred geometry. And really, after working with the Phi Yantra, you know, really opened up another area of interest. So the Phi Yantra, which I showed you in this image, was not built off of uh, the flower of life or the seed of life design. It's built off of starting with a four leaf uh, petaled design, right? One in the circle in the center and four in each of the corners. And I go from there. But this week I, I, I discovered that, uh, you know, I could do the same view from a, uh, this kind of square orientation, this square face, the decahedron edge view, from actually starting with the flower of life, not the flower of life, the seed of life, the seven circles around, uh, six circles around one. So I discovered how to create that. And, you know, the golden rectangle, which is in the, uh, uh, the icosahedron, which is this bigger blue shape, you know, we're not typically used to seeing the icosahedron in this view because most of the time it's been popularized looking like with the triangular face view, and I would recommend, besides checking out the Phi Yantra video, also the video, not all five platonic solids are in the flower of life. Um, because, you know, this has now got this little bend in it, whereas the flower of life draws that with a straight line across, at least the way it's presented in Metatron's cube. So, you know, this is a bit of a, a, a the more accurate way to draw it. And I was trying for a while now to figure out, can I actually make the design, uh, this hexagon view of the um, icosahedron and dodecahedron in this flower of life, seed of life design. Luckily, I remembered, you know, from early on, uh, Robert Lawler's book, in the last couple pages of his book, he actually gives, uh, and I tested it to make sure that these edges are in five relationships. So I scaled all these images in the program, tested to make sure that the one inch edge is the same throughout all of them. And they're all 1.618 to one inch. These are not obviously scaled together, but when I did it originally, uh, I just double checked that yes, this drawing is accurate. It's based on the seed of life, but it's based on developing the icosahedron, the blue, inside the seed of life. So you don't need any of the other circles uh, beyond that. And your dodecahedron is now gonna be created by inside this by creating a circle inside that's in phi relationship to the larger circle here. And I'm gonna show you what I mean by that in a sec. So we, you know, I, I was psyched that we had this view and now we can draw all three of these views. We're like, they're like the big three, let's say. You know, you have this vertex view, which is when you're looking straight down at the top of the icosahedron and dodecahedron, and this is where you see the pentagonal face. So that's the vertex looking down. Now this is kind of like a face view or a kind of sort of side view. And this is, you know, definitely a side view here, and it's the edge view of both the icosahedron and the dodecahedron. So this is the one that gives you the vertex overhead, um, and the other two are side views, and all three are, can be drawn within this. I really tried to see if the flower of life, I could get the dimensions accurate enough to do it, or the fruit of life, Metatron's cube. It's just that hexagonal pattern, uh, as it builds out like that, just locks in the, the, the ratio of the circles, the numbers between the circles, in a way that it won't produce the phi one to 1 1.618 measurement. You have to do it through this method here and when you're doing the, uh, the hexagon view. Now for both of these, um, the first two, this uh, edge view, this one and this one, utilize this technique I'm gonna show you uh, just to get started. And then, then the drawing becomes you know, self-explanatory. I'll probably do it how to draw each of these videos in the future. Uh, this one here has got a different method to draw the pentagonal face. And a lot of people, when they draw this, they don't actually draw in all the circles. They just do little tick marks. I'm just showing you that if you created the full circles around, you would create the seed of life pattern. You need to do it, these you know slash marks to get the edges of where you draw your lines. So, you know, when you draw the full circles, you could basically say you've created the seed of life in the design.
But here is the, uh, that, that way you at least create that. Now, uh, I say CE here uh, is NM divided by CE. I, this, this C here, uh, unfortunately, got confused with the L. The C is just showing you here where C to D. First, what you have to do is create a mark going down here, a vertical line that is the mark C. And that is in the seed of life. It's in this vesica Pisces, which is off center. You draw that line down and then you bring a line. So it's halfway between that pedal up to the top here and arc your compass down. And then it gives you the point E, which then allows you to draw this circle. And that circle is in phi relationship to this larger blue circle. So that's how you're gonna draw, get the two into proportion. So this should actually say NM divided by the LC, uh, LE line is what gives you phi. So that's a little, little mistake there I caught. Um, and then this one, I just, you don't need to do this for the other uh, video, for the other uh, drawings, but I just wanted to show you my quick method of how, uh, you know, I'd like to kind of easily divide a line. And you can do it easily with this seed of life pattern. You just draw your six petals uh, with one in the center or six circles with one in the center. So you got your seven circles and just go down to the bottom of here and just draw a line up to F to G over here. So you've just gone from the outer edge of this circle to this one. And then I just reposition my compass on the center point and then just draw that radius all the way around. That gives you out the point J. So when you draw that to point J, the K here will be the smallest part of the phi ratio. So that's this JK. And that's in relationship from the circle, KO over here. And that KO, is relationship to the whole thing, which is the J, the OJ. So OJ is, you know, uh, is to KO as KO is to JK. So that's uh, the F and the G are the equal to H and K. Uh, yes, right, FG equal to H. Oh, no, that's another mistake, it shouldn't be HK, it should be, uh, F G is equal to H J. Okay, so two two mistakes in the slide. I hope you get you get the picture of what I'm describing. So, um, all right, let's go on from there. Uh, you know, I'm just giving you a little bit of this. I know we're kind of I don't want to get bogged down too much in the drawing technique here, but this is the type of stuff that um, I wish was just straightforward presented to me in a really clear, straightforward manner. Granted, I had the book sitting on my shelf, but as I continue to hunt through all this material, sometimes it's just not as clearly uh, accurate, or accurate or presented just in a concise way that just says, hey, this is how you do this. Um, so, you know, I, uh, like I said, I don't believe there's any one view that we should get associated and attached to, but this was part of my process this week, 6.39 p.m. Um, so, I just happened to see the time up here, 639. Um, Occam's razor seeks the uh, more efficient uh, solution, right? So that's what Occam's razor is in science. And I just decided with my uh, three methods here, I'm gonna keep phi yantra as a separate one altogether because it's not based on this flower uh, seed of life design here. But I decided to just for each of these drawings, you know, actually write out how many lines that I have to draw to complete the drawing. I just accounted how many circles did I have to draw to complete the drawing and as well as how many times did I have to reset the compass, right? And then I just totaled up like, well, how many total actions did I have to do, uh, you know, in order to do the whole drawing from start to finish with all those little mic micro elements uh, and, and of course, Occam Razor say, you know, the simplest explanation is usually the best one. I'm not saying that this here is the best one, but this view, I will start to say, provides a lot more that was going to enrich our understanding of sacred geometry. And a few slides here, we'll get to that. Of course, this is the classic vertex pentagonal view that you look down and you see the pentagonal faces. It's also the most complex drawing. If you'd like to draw a lot of lines, you'll be drawing 
quite a few just to draw from each of the dodecagon here. I mean, not the, the, the decagon shape. So you've got 10, um, the decagon, uh, 10, 10 vertices along here, which are going to be drawing all lines, connecting every single one of them. And just by doing that alone, will create the icosahedron and the dodecahedron in there. You just have to highlight those lines. So, you know, you have to reset the compass three times, and you've got the most amount of circles for a total of 68 actions in that. Now the vertex view is kind of like, you know, in between these two, it's a little less uh, complex than the Pentagon, but you know, there's quite a few more steps and really like finding where you're gonna draw the lines to connect these points. Now I, I did the Phi Yantra, which is the other way that I drew this kind of square view over here, but I decided to, what I call the octahedral method, and I'll tell you why in, in a few moments, but it's based on an octahedron that was the starting point of this drawing is definitely the simplest way. Um, it, it has a few different resets of the compass and more circles, but a number of lines to complete this drawing is very few. And all of these contain the same thing. I mean, they're the same form. They're just from different views telling us different things uh, from that view. Um, the number of, uh, the number of drawing uh, to draw lines then, so after you do these base setup drawings, how many lines do you have to draw then to draw the icosahedron or the decahedron? Of course, phi yantra and octahedral, they both have 22 lines that you have to draw in order to do those, 11 for each. Uh, and then the vertex view has kind of got a, an equal distribution here of 18 and 21. And now that's just as if it's a solid. You have uh, lines on the back side of that, um, which because the cool thing uh, that I think is neat, at least with this square view here, this uh, you know uh, edge view, is that the lines that you see up close are the same lines that are directly behind. So you're really just seeing one uh, one face, but it's directly opposing this face of this triangle is another triangle on the other side. And this one over here, uh, same thing, you would have uh, you know, 40 lines to create the full icosahedron, but just 20 just to show it as a solid. So that's the 20 and 20, and then you get a total of 40 there, right? So you know, just some neat playing with the numbers, and uh, I'm, I won't make any claims of which one is the most efficient and which, it would definitely, I think the most efficient and easiest one here is clearly this one, the 37 uh, of the octahedral method, and Phi Yantra is next. Uh, these methods, Pentagon method is actually quite easy. That's just a lot of long lines to draw. And uh, so anyway, that was just a, a part of my exploration during the week. I thought I'd put that in there. Here's the the forms that are by themselves. And I just wanted to talk about a few of the properties of why this, um, this view here is really been intriguing me because this is the same view. You've just rotated it uh, you know, three times here. And the cool thing about this view is that your vertices, this is the actual sphere that the icosahedron is contained in. Now, when we look at the icosahedron and it's like flat at the tops, it looks very boxy, you know, it, it doesn't it look, to me, it's not like so appealing. Like this looks kind of cool, you know, and <laughs> this is really awesome looking, you know, with the double, the, deck, the double pentagons, it's just fantastic. And then I look at this, I'm like, huh, hmm, it's, mm, you know, it's not super moving, although it contains a fascinating amount of information. I love the view actually, uh, but, you know, if you do turn it, so there's vertex here, because this vertex is in touch with the sphere. These vert, when I put a sphere around these, which I was going to do and forgot to put them in here, you would see that these edges don't touch the, the uh, sphere that it's actually contained in, and it's same for this one. So both these views are not actually showing you where the um, edges are in contact with the sphere. Where this one, because this is a straight line through the center, when you rotate this around, this will line up. So now if you had a 20 sided die and held that in your hand and just rotated it on the vertex 
and just lined it up so it was, you know, looking like just slightly off centered. I don't know if I can get this lined up just for you. It'd be something like that, you know, um, but it's tip to tip. So now that's giving you the actual dimensions of the sphere that it's contained in. It also does that for the dodecahedron. So that is one cool thing about it. The other really neat thing about this view, which um, is building my Occam's razor case for this view containing just a phenomenal amount of information, is that it contains the golden rectangle in here based on the icosahedron, perfect golden rectangle when you draw these lines. And, uh, you know, they're all nested platonic solids. That's all in there. So, you know, you've got this. Uh, for the dodecahedron, you get a root three measurement in there. Um, but for this one, you get a lot of, um, I don't know, I don't have the dodecahedron in this, but you get that up and down thing. And this little triangle here is, you know, keep note of it. It's not on there for just any old reason. It's specific to this, uh, where I'm going with this. So I'll talk about that little triangle that's at the top there as we go through this slides. So I want to just talk about this octahedral uh, component that I was describing. And in you know, my research, I'll be doing some exploratory uh, research throughout this video a little more than some of my other recent ones because I'm kind of showing you the trail that I'm following here and how it kind of fits together and relates and connects. I came across this um, egg carton universe based on this uh, octahedral structure uh, maybe someone else will follow this trail too and check it out. I came across it in a video called The Octahedral Universe that David Wilcox, an uh, explorer of these uh, esoteric uh, teachings, uh, wisdom teachings. You know, he had a video called The Octahedral Universe, uh, Universe that I happened to come across just in the past few days. And he describes this study of these, uh, you know, physicists, uh, people who are checking this out from 1997, quite old video. In fact, that's the first year I got uh, Sacred Geometry, Robert Lawler's book. Couldn't understand any of the math in it at the time. Um, but uh, anyway, that's, that's a little, little side note. The, um, but so back in 1997, they created this octahedral structure. And, you know, I came around to that looking into this because I called this the octahedral way of drawing this because the way to draw the start this drawing, and I'm gonna zoom in here on this. Uh... So the cool thing about this is I had this visualization of this, uh, this octahedron, if you followed the edges of the octahedron, from a center point. Now remember, this is in the phi-based circle. This is the outer circle, so these are in the phi relationship. So this octahedron, if you continue that straight line, this dotted line, it will connect to the top corner of the icosahedron. And then if you continue it all the way back down here, it will connect to the corner of the dodecahedron, creating one edge of your octahedron. Now, of course, if you did that on all these other edges and there's one through here to kind of connect the octahedron that goes this way and this way and from the other side coming towards us. Same thing on the bottom here. You've just created an octahedron out of this pretty big icosahedron around here and that's putting the octahedron kind of at the center of this. So I kind of visualize this octahedron kind of at the center of this structure, universal structure as like the root form and then these edges of this octahedron just went off in straight lines and you know created the uh, dodecahedron they created the icosahedron all the way out and then you know not shortly after that that following morning you know, i had that visualization in the morning you know that day i come out and then i find this octahedral universe uh uh video and this researcher is talking about the egg carton universe and they're talking about how the clusters of uh, galaxies and star clusters are positioned in, in this research study along the edges of this octahedral symmetry in a, like a honeycomb type structure. And they measured the kind of 
what we can visibly see, you know, because they say this is like octahedron snested. I, I haven't even gone to this with my videos yet, but I have tons of drawings, um, digital drawings in the book that I'm working on that are describing this three by three cube, three by three by three to 27 cubes, uh, not cube, you could turn these into cubes, but the heart of the octahedrons at the center of those um, being one of the fundamental uh, cubic building blocks. And then to see this uh, cluster of how the galaxies were clustered at these nodal points and along the edges of the lines, you know, just really kind of blew, blew my mind um, to think about that large scale structure, right? So we're gonna go, this is like this macro universal scale of these octahedron that, you know, these octahedron, you don't just see when you look up, you know, at the stars, you, you don't quite see it, but there's this underlying lattice that was presented and called the egg carton universe. I really like the octahedral universe because it brings that octahedron back to the core uh, of the center. One, because as you continue these octahedral lines through this, uh, it's gonna continue and it will create the icosahedron and the decahedron. Likewise, you can have a giant icosahedron out there projecting through creating the octahedral structures around these. So multiple ways to look at it. Uh, and this we'll be talking about this image a little bit further on. Um, but I just wanted to point out because I'm going to go in a certain direction, start talking about the torus in, in just a little bit. Um, and these are actual pyramids uh, based on the 51.8237.8 uh, 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 pyramid of Giza, uh, or at least of Kepler's triangle and they nestle right into the upper octahedron here. And this is part of this drawing. It was created in this drawing. I'm gonna to come to that towards the end of this. Okay, so um, I know I'm going through a lot of material and like a lot of this can be, will be elaborated on in a lot of other videos, but I just have so much going on. I felt like I had to condense it all into this one video um, to at least have a starting point so I can unpack this as it goes on. But we're gonna like revisit some of the phi entra stuff just in this drawing, because I just wanna set up that we're gonna talk uh, quite a bit about this rhombic tricontahedron. So if you haven't seen that video, uh, the rhombic tricontahedron is kind of the culmination of this compound of an icosahedron and a dodecahedron from this edge view that we're looking at here. This is kind of a side view. So the icosahedron, when you just you know, link the vertices here, which they have creating 32 vertices total, where the um, 12 vertices of the icosahedron are combining with the 20 vertices of the dodecahedron to create the 32 vertices of the rhombic tricontahedron. And when you connect all those lines between those vertices, you come up with this very important form that uh, creates this rhombic face and I'll we'll describe why it's important in just a little, in a moment. Um, but that creates a face divided by one to 0.618. Of course, that's a rhombic face of the uh, phi ratio. So, you know, these, uh, I just wanna overview that again. That's how the rhombic tricontahedron is made, uh, constructed based on those forms. And, because we're going we're gonna to discuss that a little bit, but you know, part of my revelations uh, this week, you know, I did this drawing a couple of years ago, um, and I wanted to, you know, I was thinking about, you know, how is the uh, how is the torus around the human body, you know, a lot of how is it around uh, the Earth, um, and then what does the apple, the simple apple, have to teach us around this? Because the apple is considered a toroidal shape. Because I was really wondering about that edge view, square view, you know, that I'm looking at from the side. Is that torus in that view? Um, because the drawing was suggesting that. But when I when I slice this apple in half, which you know, a lot of other researchers has been around for a long time, you know, it creates a pentagonal structure right in here, and it just so happened to fit nicely in my colorful drawing here. And then that you know really made me wonder. Well. If this is a pentagonal structure here, right, pentagon, and then 
if this was an apple, you know, this torus around this person or the earth or whatever, then if this was uh, an apple, you know, around this person, if we were also to cut that in half, you know, through the center line of this, what we would see from the top down would be a five-pointed star uh, or a ten-pointed star. And I'm going to describe in multiple ways that that's the view that I think we're looking at in the Taurus. And I, you have to then wonder uh, around how does that relate to the Merkaba? Um, the, you know, because the Merkaba is a square, you know, a cube that has the vertices of the apex of the cube turned this way. But when you do that, the icosahedron point is like off to the side. Now, if the icosahedron is the center, what happens to the cube? And I'll describe that in a little bit about what happens to those cubes. And I think it's important that we maybe rethink this uh, toroidal structure and how that's related to this dodecagon symmetry and what's showing us in the apple and the torus and that the five pointed star is right in there. Well, that looks to me like that there's a pentagonal face structure in there. And I'm gonna show you multiple examples of why I am now believing that's the case. For one, here's a study uh, from 2008, and uh, this image isn't in there, but this is a cross-section of uh, DNA, the, one of the first images pictured from a top-down transverse cut of DNA, and it shows the, de the decagon, uh, I mean, the decagon symmetry of the 10 vertices around here, right? And I know there's some other images out there that have the six, and there's a few different strands of DNA. This is one of them, I believe it's the B strand that have other mandala type shapes. Some had nine, some had six. This one is clearly showing the 10 um, from up above looking straight down there. So, um, you know, in this study here, this one, which this image isn't from, but this one is, this Nature's Code, it's on ResearchGate. You know, both these people are really into this uh, 90, the articles this person's written and you know they teamed up to create this and this is the final figure seven and there's and these are just the, the the three views that i was just showing you and literally i had to do all that work and and i didn't bother researching this until maybe 20 minutes before presenting this uh, you know i was working towards it and wanted to find some more infinite information on dna and uh then came up with the same three views which was just awesome you know here they say this is the vertex view this is a, a version of a side view. This is the other side view version. All three of these are vertex views of, uh, you know, DNA kind of ratcheting it around itself. Dan Winter, another geometer uh, scientist, he is uh, way into this and I have all his books upstairs. Now I feel like I've really cracked the doorway to get more involved into his ratcheting of the DNA and the, the decagon structure here and all the five relationships he has been talking about. But this is written in Nature's Code, pretty cool article. The, the uh, preceding this in these images, they walk you through tetrahedral structures, octahedral structures, all the way up to the 64th structure. And this is what happens at the 64th replication between tetrahedral structures, you get this five-fold symmetry. And then that becomes how the biology is interfacing with uh, the, uh, the structure of the physics. Um, so anyway, I might not describe that best, check out the article, but that's what I could gather from it so far. Um, just, you know, this is prior to my uh, view of, this is early on when I was thinking of, oh, cool, this is neat. Maybe I will just put this conical structure up here. Here's this kind of torus going through the center. You know, I dropped uh, the Vitruvian man down here to have it on the heart center. So he's sitting at the base of this. Um, structure here of the rhombic tricontahedron, and you know I was like, oh, okay, well that looks that looks pretty uh, pretty cool to me. But the thing is, is that your vertice, remember, of the icosahedron, which I was just describing, is uh, tilted off center. This is what this does have going on for it, though, is that the octahedrons is straight up and down. So if you're thinking pyramid, you're thinking octahedron. Well, this is now associated to that view. And, and maybe it's all entangled in such a way that they're not rigidly fixed and structured like this. I'm sure that's probably more of the case. I'm working on deciphering 
what the geometry is uh, actually telling us around some of these questions um, that I have. And, you know, how does it feel in my body when I'm visualizing and moving in, in all these different ways? Um, so anyway, I started off with this and, you know, one morning I woke up and I was like, huh, let's check out the photon, you know, the light. And this is a, a, a picture of a single photon. And, you know, from this view, the top edges of this Maltese cross is contained within this rhombic tricontahedron of this one photon uh, photograph here. Let me move that out of the way. So you could see here's this conical uh, structure that is like this cone here. And now, you know, this, this may not be the way it is at all. I just happened to uh, see how this kind of looked overlaid here and, you know, had the Vitruvian man in there, this light emanating out of a single photon of a hologram, which I thought was quite cool. And I did the same thing with this other image in here. I know I'm just throwing images on there, but it's, it's all very interesting to just see how they lay up and line up and like, what is this, you know, telling us why is it showing up this conical structures in each directions, picture one coming this way, this one here coming straight towards you, this hyperbola, which uh, comes down here and kind of nests within the cone, it's kind of condensing at the center point. It just seemed to really fit that rhombic tricontahedron uh, shape really nicely of how it opens up like that. So just more to explore with the light because ge the sacred geometry is the language of light. So we would think that, you know, and clearly that the light is structured with geometry within it and uh, it's showing up and manifesting in our DNA, which is a light, which is, uh, you know, in earth structures within the plants and the trees, you know, it's continuing to show up in all our crystalline structures. It's the sacred geometry. Now in my little, you know, discovery of the photon, uh, photographs. Here's a new one, relatively new, 2019. Now this is the first ever photograph captured of quantum entanglement, okay, where the two or more entangled particles of these photons are connected via their quantum states. So this is a groundbreaking photo showing this. Um, this is a brief moment of time in a strong form of quantum entanglement. So, you know, I looked at that image and I saw these two little half you know, you know, kidney bean type shapes on the sides here. And I was just like, okay, that looks familiar or something I've been staring at quite a while now. What happens if I just took, remember early on there, I said, let me just back up and show you. I showed you this little, uh, you know, root drawing technique here of how do I create a circle inside another circle that's in phi relationship. And, you know, just I'm a pattern seeker, pattern hunter, and, you know, that's maybe some of these questions and pattern seeking can kind of put things together that don't fit, and I'm totally open to that. But I'll put it out there anyway, just to consider, you know, look at this relationship of this inner red circle to the blue circle, which is the same relationship of 1 to 1.618, you know, is dividing this kidney bean shape, or at least the, the largest, darkest color of it, in, into containing a larger circle with another circle with inside the center. It's, of course, it's not here, but maybe that's just the torso, the energy of the movement of the energy of that going through the center, like in the, the torus that I'm showing you. I know this is a lot of speculation. This is just showing like uh, my process of how I like to engage with this material. It's, it makes it very enriching and um, unifying and connective of how these, you know, different scales we just you know from a, we just went from the octahedral model of the universe uh, galaxy clusters down to the photon showing to me the continued structures of sacred geometry and this is what sacred geometry has been telling us it's been pointing to us and i find it fascinating that you know we're not creating these geometries. These geometries are existing and we just started drawing squares and circles and that involved in the pentagons and different methods and mathematics that associated with them. And we're just so happening to discover 
when we cut DNA in half, that dodecagon that someone drew, you know, 5,000 years ago, of the decagon someone drew 5,000 years ago, when it is actually the DNA cut in half. Did they know that then? Well, maybe in some places they did. Maybe in other ways, they were just exploring and contemplating and drawing this, and we're just continuing to re-engage and reawaken to what this information is really telling us. So we're gonna we're gonna scale it into the Earth level now, um, and you know because the rhombic tricontahedron is con connected to the uh, Earth grid. And I have some more pictures of the Earth grid coming up. This is the Earth grid proposed by Becker Hagen's grid. It's called the Unified Vector Geometry. And what I'm showing you here in this is now I have the icosahedron tilted up rather than this square orientation, which I was showing you earlier. But remember, this is now the icosahedron is pointed up. So that whole rhombic tricontahedron, because that's the vertice. Uh, of this little colorful ball here. That vertice is at the top, and then when I'm looking straight down at that, there's the, the pentagonal structure pointing down. So that then again says, well, yes, the Earth has a magnetic field, which is a torus, which has a dodec uh, uh, pentagonal structure at its vertex. So the orientation is vertex up on the icosahedron. So I'm going to talk about that little triangle off to the side. It's a little obscured earlier in my video. As I said, there's a little triangle that I had. You could see it down here, this little, this little thing here. Let me zoom in here a little bit more so I can, um, oops, you see this a little better. So, oopsie, let's go back. Okay, so here is the, uh, so I, I was like, okay, well, I've, I've got that little triangle here and I didn't describe this. Let's just make this really big for a second and then I'm just gonna delete it so you could see. Because early on I said there was a, uh, a pyramid in this structure that is created. It's a new way to, and I'll show you at the end of this video, there's a new way to get a perfect pyramid Kepler triangle in here. It doesn't have to be based on one, but it will give you, you know, some version of a square root of phi. And that, in that drawing, it's pointing straight up along this axis. So I brought it out here, you know, and just put it and pretended there is the pyramid on the surface of the Earth. Because remember, we're looking at this from a side view, so the Earth is round. So if I'm looking at it from the, sa from the side, there's the pyramid sitting on the surface of the Earth. Of course, it's a lot bigger now. <laughs> But it's, it started off from this pyramid that's inside, that's connected to that octahedron that's touching that inside, and I projected it out over to here. And then I rotated this whole structure, the, the whole thing, and so the vertex was oriented up like this, right, of the icosahedron. And then I said, cool, well now I've got an angle here that, you know, is showing me where that pyramid is on the earth. And I just said, okay, let's just pretend that unit is one, a distance of one from the center. It's not, but it doesn't, doesn't really matter because all I'm interested in is in the angle. It's uh, 31.717 degrees. And I know that this UVG point here is 31 degrees 43 minutes. Now that's important. And this took me a while to realize this when I was studying the pyramid is, you know, the 5151 and so on and so forth. That's in relationship to degree minutes, seconds per arc, not in just regular degrees along with 360. That is just 70, you know, 31.717. So I was like, oh shoot, it didn't line up with the UVG1 because the UVG1 is 31 degrees, 43. But then I went into the triangle calculator and I said, well, what is 31.717? I plugged in my numbers. I came up with this. And then luckily this tells me what the degrees are here, 31, 43, 3. Okay, so 
this is 3143, uh, you know, and something else beyond. I just hovered over this. That's UVG1, okay? That's the, the kind of central point of the whole grid system is that. Now, when people talk about the Earth grid and the pyramid being the center of all that, it is very close to that. It's slightly off. It, you know, it's, it's a little further south and just east uh, of that line a little bit or just to the west of that line a little bit. So it's 3112. This is 3108. This is the 2958 to the 3143. It's kind of like at the mouth of the whole uh, Nile here. Um, so I, you know, I was really uh, excited about, well, now I have transposed my sacred geometry drawings. And I just want to point out like why this is so uh, exciting to me. is like, I'm just starting off with the sacred geometry here going through my process of these drawings and then just contemplating and discovering how it fits into this big picture and to have the earth tilt when I line up this, well, then that is how the UVG is done. It, it is drawn with the pentagonal structure at the top like this. So of course, that line is gonna show up at that UVG one point on the side, which is very close to where the pyramid is. So it's quite cool to look at the pyramid from this view, it's right about here, on the surface of the earth. And, you know, it got me thinking, well, you know, a while back it was like, well, maybe the pyramid isn't, you know, straight up and down, you know, directly above our heads. Uh, it is if we're in there, but in terms of this large pattern, you know, where the magnetic field is and everything, which I've got an image coming up of that, it's positioned, you know, quite a number of degrees off, you know, from, uh, you know, 60 or 59 degrees off from the, the top uh, of the, the whole structure. So here's the, uh, the pattern of that with the UVG1 and that whole earth grid system. And, you know, inside this um, structure is the, uh, the dodecahedron is inside that icosahedron. And of course, when we rotate that icosahedron, so the vertex up, what you're gonna get is the dodecahedron is now uh, flat here. The dodecahedron is flat. It's not at the vertice. It's not in the edge view. The dodecahedron becomes flat. And when the dodecahedron becomes flat, each of these five vertices around here are actually a representation of one of the five cubes that are in here. Um, so I, I was contemplating that one of five cubes. Now all five cubes, each of those five cubes are contributing to this circle that's being created between those five. So the Merkaba, which is usually with the one vertex pointed up, when you actually put it in a de decahedron, if you put that one vertice up, then all the other five vertices are not in equal proportion or relationship to that. You've selected one over all of them. We're also eliminating the icosahedron that's built around this. But maybe all five together create a circle, which is this conical structure between the five. And now that creates the torus field. Here's the pyramid off to the side. So this dodecahedron is this distance right here at the top surface, it extends a little bit beyond either side. And uh, I wanna thank uh, one of my viewers here, Luke. Uh, he commented about another fella, um, Anake uh, Logos, who did this awesome video that uh, really uh, got me thinking about this, these angles, which I'd never really considered is what's the angle inside the dodecahedron from this corner down to the base here, to the tip, and back up. And that's 58.3 to 63.4. Okay, so that, these angles are gonna become important in just a moment. Uh, he points it out early on his video. I'm gonna show you on my next slide why these two angles are super important. But anyway, straight down, if we create a little, here's this pentagonal face, the red one, is gonna match up 
to the outer edges of that. So we've got this inch circle, let's just call it, that is actually like a cone that's going from the top to the bottom through the center of this. So, you know, it's looking flat here, but just picture it's two cones meeting top to bottom. And now you have this conical structure that is creating these source field rings that are going way out, you know, like a magnetic field uh, coming in and circulating up and back and around like that. And if you take it a few steps further, here's, here's the dodecahedron. Each of those pentagonal faces will have that. So you have 12 faces, conical structures around one, and each of those are opposing another one. So you have this complete, not just straight up and down, you have multiple directions of uh, you know, six axes going through there that are conical structures. Of course, that could be moving or spinning and all that. You also have this, which is, you know, this is also going to be important. I'll show you more on this one later. This is in a regular cube. You can have those same little conical structures from the top and the bottom. Consider this around octahedron, okay, or a pyramid. So, you know, here, let's just talk about this angle because back in my uh, phi yantra drawing, which I still believe is a, quite a, a, a template to get acquainted with because it contains what really opened up my view to the, what I'm sharing here with you uh, is this phi yantra template because early on I was showing in the other videos now, if this was square right here was uh, the base of a pyramid, all you had to do was just fold up these four outer triangles and have them meet in the center. And what would happen was you'd create the 51.8273 degree angle, which would be, you know, if you're looking at the pyramid um, with the edge at the base, so it'd be two inches across, then that would give you the square root of phi straight up and down. This angle right here, uh, from the top is 63.4 and 58.3, all right? So this whole drawing, I mean, I went into this, all these little numbers that you see here, which are blurry and tough to zoom in on. Just realize every single one of these little numbers is either 63.4 or 58.3. And I didn't realize that till after, <laughs> after I saw this uh, Anaki Soul, Anaki Logos video, uh, where he points this out in the dodecahedron, I said, oh, 63.4, 58.3. I went back and just started to analyze the drawing here because he said that was the pyramid angle, uh, you know, with just the face of the pyramid if it was flat. You know, we're so fixated or I don't know, fixated or focused that, you know, you always hear at least 51.51 degrees, which is not actually this in degree minutes. Um, this is 51.8273. I mean, you know, this angle is you know, quite prevalent in our research of sacred geometry. But this is actually what the angle of that triangular face is, 58.3 to 63.4. And then I started to notice it not only there, it's also in these rhombic faces of the rhombic dodecahedron. So the whole rhombic dodecahedron, if you divided this by 6.18, right, from here to here, this angle, if you just folded these up, get four of these together, put them together, you've just created the pyramid. The whole rhombic dodecahedron creates the pyramid faces uh, when you divide these rhombic faces in half. 58.3 right here, the 63.4. So, uh, you know, there's a real trail to discover. Uh, just thanking Luke again for that. He also mentioned the hyperbola. Um, and I, that played into some of my things with the photon earlier on. So I do appreciate um, and read every comment that someone posts there. Uh, and the many in the past have been insightful and led me on to more discoveries of my own. That, um, so yeah, I'm thankful and grateful for those people who share some of their interests and knowledge and wisdom of what they um, are interested in, even if it's uh, in uh, opposition to what I'm presenting here. So um, this I just wanted to show is how that, um, this little blue circle is where this blue line is across here. And of course the red, that little tip on either side, it's kind of contained within the, uh, the smaller 
pentagonal surface that's created in there. I could explain that better, but if you drew it and just drew the inside of that, you'd see what I mean. All right, so I went into Google Earth and uh, I lined up now, I put the apex because this is the UVG grid and this is also in Google Earth. You can go to one of the sites, do some research on the UVG grid and you can actually just get a downloadable file that you can open up in Google Earth. I was working with a, a while ago. I haven't really revisited this in, in quite some time. But now I said, well, hey, I can, this view that we're looking at, I can position the view. Here's the, where the pyramid, this is UVG1 right here. Um, and there's the pyramid just south of that. And I said, well, great. Now I can just orient my position of my drawing. I can drag this over top. And of course, this is not a perfect sphere. I'm dealing with a flat structure, but I can line it up well enough and, and I've got a second image which does it a little better because here I've just made the circles act the same size but as you can see when you're dealing with the curved surface rather than these flat everything kind of bows out a little bit but this pattern here that you're looking at is essentially it's not essentially it is the same spherical version of this well not exactly I'm going to show you some research that it's not exactly the same spherical version because um, what's going on here is like the icosahedron within this has the vertices touching, not the dodecahedron. See, that's not touching. This, these vertices that are not touching in this are dodecahedron vertices. But on this UVG grid, it's showing that this should be touching right over here. And it's not actually, if you just use the rhombic tricontahedron on its own, so that's just something important to consider. And I'm gonna clarify and, and correct that here in this video, how to make the icosahedron that's in there and the dodecahedron of this rhombic tricontahedron touch all the way around. Um, because these are all the points, you know, many sacred sites are in close proximity to these. So they're gonna be lining up around these. So these points of the outside of the dodecahedron should also be coming in contact. Of course, they could be in the earth too, that's cool. Um, but if we wanted a perfectly spherical structure where all those points are touching, right now we only have 12 vertices touching. And there's a total of 32 vertices on that rhombic tricontahedron. So what, what's up with the other 20 vertices? Stay tuned, you'll find out. Just a quick uh, drawing uh, that I put the rhombic tricontahedron in here. Um, this is, you know, not my drawing, but I just put the, you know, the torus field here by the magnetic field. Now you also have a rotation, a geographical north pole here, which is this is the axis of rotation, but your magnet that's in here has its own set of torus field going on uh, by a bar magnet. And it's, you know, it was a little confusing to grasp at first because you think north would line up with the North Pole, but the bar magnet itself is the opposite. Your south is up here, so that's a south magnetic pole, and your north magnetic pole is down here. So that creates this motion going from pulling in and coming, projecting out to create this magnetic field that goes around this. And the north magnetic pole is at the bottom of the south geographic pole and vice versa for the north and south magnetic pole, north, north geographic south. So, you know, just tying things together, you know, this doesn't match the same angular torus field. This is a 12 degrees difference between this and this uh, line here of the, the magnetic pole and the axis of rotation. Just wanted to put that in there. I don't have a lot more research I can say on that, but hopefully someone else will follow it along further. Now, here's how I'm gonna kind of correct that. Um, I mean, I don't know if it's a correction. I, I, you know, we could do it any way we want. It's at least, to me, I'd like to see what form created, creates a 32 vertices that will touch because that's actually what we're looking at in that UVG grid. But what appears to be what we're looking at is that if we're drawing a sphere and we're tying rubber bands, let's just say we took a rubber band and we say, I'm gonna draw an arc all the way around this and it should touch all these vertices that we go. Right now, we only got the 12 vertices of the icosahedron showing up. So we should have the other 20 showing up as well that are contributing by the decahedron. So once again, I went into my visualization mind 
And I was like, okay, what's going to happen? Basically what has to happen is either the icosahedron has got to shrink, suck in a little bit, or the dodecahedron just needs to inflate some. And I wound up creating it in the Phi Yantra. I woke up at 2 a.m., you know, and started working on this this morning and tried multiple attempts to figure out how do I create this and went to sleep again at four o'clock, woke up around, you know, a little bit later. And then within 20 minutes of the second time working on it, I figured it out how to actually create this correctly within this Fiantra design, um, which, you know, for me as a geometer is pretty ecstatic because I'm not just saying, hey, this looks close or this looks good. These are lining up with the exact points of where these should come at, uh, come in. Now, I did a video early on, like something with the sacred geometry of unified field or something like that. And I went through like 50 geometric structures or 40 geometric structures of how they're all nested and with the, within each other. And I'm pretty sure I had this one in there. I have to go back and look at those slides. Um, but, you know, by then I wasn't, I didn't have a good geometric way, a good design way to actually draw them. Um, and now I discovered how I can draw this in here. And I'll do a video on that at some point too, because, you know, you come up with this. Now this is in its square orientation. And now, of course, I'm going to rotate that. So the icosahedron is up. And now remember, here's your rhombic tricontahedron. Here's still the pyramid. That would still be along this axis here. Um, here is, these are the sunken in version of the rhombic tricontahedron. Well, the pentacus, the decahedron, which is essentially is the decahedron with just a little raised peak. And finding out where that little raised peak to create these separate little uh, isosceles triangle is the trick, you know, and, and that's why it was so exciting for me to discover it in this design. Um, but now this is very cool because what you get when you do that is you create a pentahexa relationship between these two. So you've kind of got the six isosceles here that are coming together, creating a hexagon shape, also connected to the pentagon shape here of the five. So you've got a six and five going on here. Now this has got 60 faces, so we just increased the number of faces from the rhombic tricontahedron, which had 30, all the way up to 60, and it still has 32 vertices. Now all of them are in contact with the surface, and it has 90 edges. So yeah, pretty cool. And then I decided to, once again, I just put this here to show you how now, how this one is fitting over the, uh, the earth grid from a uh, space of uh, lined up in the same way. So here is the, uh, you see this pentagon right here is that pentagon right there. And there's like, uh, Another, uh, so what's going to happen here is they're drawing a connection point between that and that. So that, that's why you needed to do that. And that, so, so you see that this, through this Pentagon, you've got radiating out. So if you're going to draw a line from here through the center of that Pentagon, you see the way it comes across here, it's got to touch that vertice right there, which didn't touch before. And now it cuts through, it comes through there. Same thing with this one as it goes around. If I follow that line all the way up, see that point right there, uh, top of Africa here, as that comes around, it's got to touch the vertice on the earth or above the earth, but at least to create a sphere. So I believe this is the, the view, the next step up from a rhombic tricontrahedron. You've got to go through the rhombic tricontrahedron to get there. Um, and it unlocks all the potentials of the geometry that are there. But this is why this view is, is key this kind of phiantra octahedral view that I showed you from early on, the Occam razor view of why I'm saying this is such an important view, is it gives us the north-south axis of the earth grid. And it gives us, um, you know, uh, the pentagonal view of the DNA is from that other view of the Pentagon looking straight down. Uh, but this allows us to put the torus field from a side view looking at it from the side and seeing what it would look like from the side, not just from the top. So that's what this view is doing. 
So, you know, um, just moments after creating that pentagus, pentacus to decahedron, swiftly on the heels as these geometries unlock inside one another, um, another form emerged, which of course is known, like this stuff is out there, I'm not discovering something new, but in, for me, it's the thrill of the discovery of it is new in the moment, because I start working on it and discover, well, hey, if I connect these center points within that, and I'll get a pentagon and a hexagon here, and what I've just created is a famous structure constructed by Bucky, Buckminster Fuller. So this is now super important form. All of them are, but this one, uh, I didn't expect I'd be going in this direction, but it just happened to manifest. We've got the truncated icosahedron, which is also carbon 60. So this is stuff that's like found out in the universe in star galaxies. It's found on meteorites on Earth. Um, it's in a lot of different uh, Earth-based things. It's carbon, so carbon 60 is basically a soccer ball <laughs> when it comes down to it. Luckily, I was able to find a soccer ball that is actually taken in a photograph that isn't just lined up with the pentagon uh, with the six around it. So you've got six hexagons around the pentagon, and that's our soccer ball. So carbon-60 is basically a soccer ball. Here's what it looks like in this pentagonal structure. Now, carbon-60, when you do some research on it, uh, many people use it as a health supplement and it's supposed to be, there's like a long list of things that are very good. And then in the same thing, research with the Wikipedia site, it says it's, you know, can be toxic to humans and can't be in light because it produces toxins. So it has to be stored in bottles that are, you know, uh, not transparent, so no light will penetrate it. So just do some research, more research on this and find out more about carbon-60. I knew it was something because I saw it a long time ago, people talking about carbon-60 in some spiritual site or something like that. Um, and so, but anyway, carbon-60, Bucky's thing that he made, Buck, Buck, uh, Buckminster Fullerine is what it's called, uh, is the, uh, his con one of his many contributions and here it is within this phi entra design. Uh, so now I just, I'm gonna back up because I kind of completed. So that we've gone through like our D, the DNA, we've gone through some Taurus stuff in the human body. You know? We've gone through the, uh, the earth now, we've gone through that octahedral universal structure. Um, so those are kind of, you know, many different scales. You know, man is the measuring stick, Man and woman are the measuring stick, the human being the measuring stick. We've gone down to the photon even, you know, atomic structure. We're seeing sacred geometry through all of those. Uh, and it's all connected to these protonic solids and other geometric forms that are being constructed from, you know, like tetrahedrons and octahedrons as the root foundation. And a while ago, um, you know, I came up with a structure that I'll show you at the end because I've got my last two slides here. And in the video that I called Sacred Geometry Unifying Thing, I, I got another video called uh, Introducing the Pyrohedron. And no one probably ever heard of Pyrohedron. I just was like, this is something that's out there. I never thought in where I was going with this. And all of a sudden, I would create the Pyrohedron at the center of this whole thing, all right? And, you know, I was just, I was blown away. I had to pace around the house, you know, for like 10 minutes, be like, what, the pyrohedron again? This came back out of nowhere? And not out of nowhere, but it came back into the center of the whole structure. So remember early on, uh, you know, how I put the pyramid out on the surface of the earth over here at the side. So what I did, what I found was that there's actually a place within this, and I'm going to show you where it is. So now, why, uh, let me back up before I show you that. So this is a um, design that um, is now 12 circles around one. So 13 around one, of course, is a super important number. Uh, you know, a lot of people associate 13 around one with the cube octahedron because you have one point in the center expanding out to the 12. Well, here we've got the 12 circles. Now, picture this, as you could picture these concentric circle, these circles here radiating around as like a top down on the tip of a pyramid this way. If you remove those, many of those circles and just focus on the two like this, 
two out to the sides, well, you'll be looking at a torus field from the side, okay? So we've kind of created a torus field in two views here, one from the top down and from the side view. And that's what's the beauty of this view that I'm talking about here is that it's showing a side view, uh, it's showing us the top down view all in one. And now we've got a torus field kind of created around this. So now this is uh, in the crystal life group, crystal spiral uh, advocates. And the re I don't really uh, advocate for one thing or the other. I guess I'm Fiantra is my thing that I'm advocating and interested in. Um, but I don't have any problem with any of the other flower of life, eternal life lotus, and looking at what they're going to share to inform the whole. And just as what I hope I'm sharing here is informing the whole. You may not like it. It might not fit with the structure of the belief system that's associated with one or the system of thought. But it's all coming down to just looking at the geometry here. But this is the eternal life lotus, the drawing. It's just 12 circles, two seeds of life over top of one another. And um, the, what's cool here is I, I based this on a double octave. Uh, icosahedron. So I took the icosahedron, I created it so the icosahedron touches in both sides. This will probably create a form that I'll construct at some point. I didn't get there yet. But this, uh, this point right here in the corner of where the icosahedron edge meets this circle of this torus, let's just call it the, the side torus view, Right at that spot, if you draw a straight line, I mean, you could continue that line through. You can continue it as far as you want. You could put it right at this base, wherever you want. But this is the this is the section where it meets. And, you know, I was like, well, I'm going to draw that. And this I did in a highly precise drawing thing that tells me this is 51.8273 because I tested it against the square root of phi, which is right here. And if I arc that up to there, that is the square root of phi. Um, which is the 1.272 in my previous Fiantra video, I talk all about that. So this is the, uh, this is the central uh, circle of the design, which is in phi relationship to this outer circle. So this is important. This is all phi-based relationships going on here. And the uh, I, octahedron, which is the light gray line, it's not these curved lines, it's going around the outside. So that octahedron, remember, the octahedral uh, universe, if you continue that line out, it meets the icosahedron edge uh, vertice, it meets the icosahedron vertice. Well, I connect that pyramid to the top of the octahedron, which means inside that octahedron, there's a pyramid, which, because they don't have the same size base, but they are, tips are meeting, and I'm gonna end my line now with that long line that I continued from there, I'm going to end it right here with inside that horizontal line. So now I just created an uh, octahedron. The octahedron's there. I created a pyramid, this red one, with the correct tr Kepler triangle in here, a double pyramid because I came from the other side. And I'm going to create another one because I can come from this side and I can come from this side. So I've got one pyramid up, one down, two to the left and right. And because this is a three-dimensional object, as I've showed you, we have one coming up towards us and one pointing away from us. And that's the pinnacle of the pyramid that you see here. So that's the pyramid pointing up and down. There's the torus around it. Excuse me. The other ones are coming in like this from the, the top and side views. So I made this. This is why this is profoundly amazing to me is I made this form about a year and a half ago and I was calling it the pyrohedron. I got a whole videos on it where I talk about this form and now it's a thing. It's like an actual structure that exists within this and the amazing thing about, another amazing thing about it is that this square is, um, it's going to be doing two things. So you picture there's a square coming towards you. There's a plane like this and there's a horizontal plane. So that's an X, Y, Z axis. Right there, if you just connected those points all the way around, you created the cube octahedron. Yet, you also have 
this vertice up here of the pyramid poking through the cube octahedron. So the cube octahedron is slightly inflated. I've got some props at the end I'm going to show you. It's slightly inflated, but the neat thing here is that square, a two inch square, or whatever size we're going to work with, with that two inch square, that right there, that squares the circle. So in my other videos, I talk about squaring the circle. That pyramid circle is in relationship to that square, and they are in uh, equal perimeters, right? So that's at the, to me, that's like at the heart of the whole thing, the pyrohedron. You know, I call it the pyrohedron because it's a pyramid, the fire within the center of the whole thing, and all the other forms that I've been showing you, and I tried to do this early on, it's just amazing how things kind of come back around in the research. You never, uh, every little thing I've ever done in sacred geometry has come back to reveal itself. And at the time, I might be like, why am I doing this? What am I doing? What, what pyrohedron? Why am I making, why am I drawing this? It comes back into play, and here it is being constructed based on this eternal life with the pyramid at the center. Uh, these are just, of course, um, that's the dodecahedron. Now here, <laughs> excuse me, I wanted to show that the cube, which would be the square, also has these uh, conical structures. So picture those cones at the top of the pyramid, pointing left and right, up and down, and front and back. And then now you have the uh, uh, six vertices of that pointing in both directions. Uh, left and right, up, down, front, back. And that is what you've got here in terms of the vertices of the pyrohedron. And then I completed the pyrohedron because this is now the accurate drawing of the pyrohedron that I did. I don't, I don't care what we call it. It's just what I called it, the fire in the middle. <laughs> there's, a, there's a peridohedron, I, and I'll talk about that in another further discussion. But I call this one the pyrohedron because of the pyramids, it's a central foundation. And you'll see in my other video, if you go and check it out, I'm curious to watch what I was talking about at the time. <laughs> and uh, so here it is, these little caps on top of the cube octahedron are where the pyramid comes out, and then that squares the circle. Um, that's not there anymore, but squares the circle, the phi base circle. It's at the heart of the whole phi base thing. Um, all right. so. I don't know how long I went on there, but you know, I'm really um, excited about this. As you can see, a lot of things have come together. Let me just wrap up and show you a few of the forms. This is, the, this is one I built a while ago, which is the pyrohedron. Um, and to get the light on it just right. So there's the pyramid sticking up out of the top. These were the flat faces. If you took those off, you've got the cube octahedron. Now remember, this is like a, I don't know, it's like a spiritualized cube octahedron, which many people consider already spiritualized, but this is squaring the circle because this square that I'm gonna show you um, in here, if, if this was uh, this edge right here, from here to here, is the square. So when I connect this circle to this point up to here, to this point over here, it's gonna cut through that square edge that the other pyramid that's pointing towards you, it's going to square the circle. So this is like a cube octahedron that's squaring the circle around itself. It's pretty cool um, to me, but is the, this is what I call the pyrohedron. At the time I did, and this is, these are things from like two years ago. So, you, you know, I'm just was, as I said, flabbergasted, it came back. Here I made it so I could see the inside. I created this structure here uh, with just wire and the colored thing. So here is a pyramid facing up and down, coming to the top. There's the square base that it's on, and there's the little pyramid at the top. So if I draw a circle connecting through that, it's gonna clip these corners and that's the squared circle. So it's that cube octahedron with the pyramid in the middle. And then this was like the solid version of it. Um, like this, looking at it straight on. It's got a little, got a little warped over time. It's holding together pretty good. Oh, there we go. So there's that square base. Anyway, 
it's neat for me to come back to this one and see how it all ties together. But I just want to kind of summarize and wrap up that um, hopefully you enjoyed that uh, sacred geometric uh, journey through the discoveries that I've been working on um, and seeing how it's linked together, kind of telling you some of my stories around how it kind of all's kind of connecting. Of course, it's not all about me. It's about all these uh, beautiful, amazing sacred geometry that is me. <laughs> so it is all about me. It is all about me in that sense, because it's about all of us. It's about all of it. It's about our planet. It's about our universe. It's about our photons. It's about our atoms. It's about our DNA. You know, it's about a creation, you know, um, a, a, create, a beautiful, beautiful creation. God's creation is the best way to define it. Um, a creation that's, that has a design within it. And I believe the sacred geometry is showing us this. And as scientists continue to probe into the mysteries and continue to reveal their work, we continue to see how the ancient wisdom was encoded in this sort of things. And they might not have said it was in the DNA at the time, but we're discovering that all these things are relating to how our earth grid lines up with how the DNA is. So um, this is a culminating video for a lot of discoveries that I'm gonna to have to continue to hash out and continue to look at as uh, time goes on and bring more to it and continue to show you how to draw this stuff because I believe that's what activates and encodes this stuff, helps you become into a relationship with it in a way that um, you know may just look like a simple drawing to you, but that is going into your eyes, you know, feeding your eyes. It's feeding your whole being through look, doing that, and it's activating certain elements to awaken this uh, primordial essence that we all are. So I appreciate you taking the time to watch us, and I do say that, like I said, I mentioned uh, a, a viewer who posted some things, please uh, continue to post. I appreciate all the comments and enjoy uh, where they lead me down the trail. And New Geometers is a site that I have on Facebook um, group that I'm working with to you know share more of these drawings and videos with. Um, so yeah, I look forward to the next one and thanks for watching. Much love and peace.